Welcome to the Ortho Real Surgical Series. You're seeing again the surgeon's eye view of some of the procedures that we do. In this particular case, we're doing a total knee replacement with a custom implant system. So you will see a fully customized implant as well as the use of personalized cutting blocks that are used to guide the surgery. These are produced with 3D printing and are specific just to this patient. So in this step where the skin has been prepared uh, to preserve sterility, we're making some marks to ensure that the closure is accurate as far as lining up the skin edges. We're applying a tourniquet to the leg. Some knee replacements are done uh, without the use of a tourniquet for this particular uh, procedure. Uh, we did use one. You can see that this patient's knee does not quite fully extend at the beginning of this procedure. So we spent some time doing soft tissue releases and other measures during the surgery to restore this. Here we're just helping to uh, wrap up the foot. In the background, you can see the patient-specific plan for this case that shows us where the implants will fit and what the resection levels are. We're making a perforation in this wrap that is associated with the tourniquet. And then we're applying an adhesive drape that's impregnated with betadine to help ensure sterility and to keep any bacteria on the skin or in the skin pores uh, from coming to the surface during the procedure. With the knee fully prepped and draped, we are ready to begin the procedure. You will get some glare from the headlamp that I'm using. I'm feeling for anatomic landmarks, in this case the tibial tubercle and the patella. And we're beginning the skin incision. Getting a little bit of glare from the overhead lights here, but just peeling back a little bit of the subcutaneous tissue so that we can begin our exposure to the knee. We try not to release any more of this than is necessary. Um, we want good exposure, but too much can cause additional uh, bleeding and swelling. Here we're completing some of the release of subcutaneous tissues. And this is what is known as the arthrotomy. We are entering the joint at the junction between the quadriceps muscle and the quadriceps tendon. And we're coming just to the inside or the medial side of the patellar tendon. Fortunately, you're getting a lot of glare from my lights at this point. Here you're seeing us begin to enter the joint and release some more soft tissues for exposure of the joint. This medial soft tissue sleeve is elevated in one flap to allow us to place retractors. Here you're seeing a retractor placed to protect the medial collateral ligament as we do part of this exposure. It's a little bit difficult to see because of the glare, but you're already seeing large bone spurs and wearing away of the cartilage on this medial side of the knee which is, of course, why we're doing the replacement. We're now bringing the knee to extension. We're 
releasing soft tissues and a portion of the retropatellar fat pad. In this step, we're excising a large portion of the retropatellar fat pad, which essentially is in the way. Uh, and if too much of this is left, it can actually interpose in the joint and cause swelling or pain. Up top, we take a small amount of the synovium or the lining tissue, uh, as well as a little bit of super patellar uh, fat pad. This just allows us to see the bone. We're using an anatomically shaped implant, and so we want to define that bone well. In this step, I'm using two clips to help me hold the patella or the kneecap and feel it. We release soft tissues around the edge. Uh, in some circles, this step is actually thought to denervate the patella or to help uh, potentially uh, reduce pain associated with this. In this step, I'm taking away some bone spurs from the patella as well as some of the adjacent soft tissues and helping to define its anatomy. I'll feel the posterior surface of the patella so that I'm in the correct plane. You're sort of looking down the barrel of a, a saw at this point. As we take away the worn cartilage and the worn out surface on the posterior part of the patella. I'm feeling that to ensure a flat cut and we're applying this device that helps to prepare for the patellar implant. My assistant prepares the drill holes. Trial implants are applied. We want to make sure that we have the correct size that covers the posterior of the patella but does not overhang. And so in this instance, we've selected a slightly different size, which again uh, seems to cover uh, without overhang. The patella is then subluxed or basically tucked into the lateral side of the knee. We're releasing a little bit of soft tissue and bringing the knee back up to flexion. Placing retractors to expose the femur see the large area of wear on the medial side. In this step, I'm releasing some fat pad and a portion of the lateral meniscus. Clearing out some anterior soft tissues, I'm actually releasing what's left of the anterior cruciate ligament at this point. And this knee is a posterior cruciate substituting knee that we're using for this particular patient. So I'm going ahead and releasing a portion of the posterior cruciate ligament to help in our exposure. This is called the F1 guide. It fits onto the bone. That is a 3D printed guide that specifically fits that patient and basically snaps right into position because it's contoured exactly to this patient's bone. Because all of this is referenced off bone, I'm clearing away cartilage with those uh, two small holes. and We're putting on um, a combination guide that is called the F2, F3 guide, referring to the femur. Again, this basically locks directly into position and fits in exactly one place because it is contoured specifically for that, that patient. We then use pins hold this guide exactly in position. With those pins in place, I'm now using a drill to prepare two holes that will be used in a subsequent step to place pins for another guide. Part of that guide is then removed. We carefully change position. The amount of bone that's being cut is known to us because of the uh, pre-made surgical plan. 
And although you can't see it in this video because you're looking at the saw, I'm able to determine if those measurements correlate with what I'm seeing and make sure that we're taking away the appropriate amount of bone. This is called the distal femoral resection because we're taking away a little bit of cartilage and a little bit of bone from the end of the femur. That guide is removed. I again, check carefully and make sure that we've made a smooth cut. In this step, you'll see my assistant remove the pins that we've placed. I identify the two drill holes that we've made previously. And by hand, we place two smooth pins that fit into those previously prepared holes. Those allow us to place what is called the F4 block. You'll see me check the position of this against anatomic landmarks. In this particular system, uh, while this is custom, there are about five degrees of, of freedom as far as how much this can be rotated. Uh, we select what we believe to be appropriate and use headed threaded pins to secure this block to the bone. The pins that we slid the guide over are removed. And here we make additional cuts on the femur in order to shape the bone for this implant. These patient-specific guides are extremely accurate, but we check those carefully and make sure that we're matching the bony surface as well as we complete those cuts. With this system, we'll now go ahead and drill. Uh, those are lug holes for the implant that we'll place. And we're completing now the posterior resection of the femur. So in most systems, this block has four cuts in it, an anterior cut, a posterior cut, and two chamfer cuts. Uh, that particular block has an anterior one chamfer and a posterior cut. And then we'll apply yet another block. Uh, this is a little bit different from conventional systems because it does have an extra set of chamfer cuts. I'm taking away some residual bone. Uh, you're getting a little bit of glare and obviously seeing a little, little bit of uh, material on the windshield there um, I, that I think is magnified because of the camera. I can obviously see through this pretty well. This is what's called the F5 block. This fits into position. So normally there is one posterior chamfer cut for a femur that would have taken place on, on something analogous to the previous block. This particular design, because it's custom, has two chamfers. So you'll see me make two cuts on each side of the knee here. We then remove that block and clean up bony debris. And we've still got another step on our femur. This is referred to as the F6 block. Because this is a posterior stabilized knee and we're sacrificing the posterior cruciate ligament, we have this additional block that's used to cut a to cut what is referred to as a notch or a box which is just a small cutout within the implant that permits the use of a small post on the tibial implant. I guess it finally got in the way. Had to do a little, uh, little squeegee job there. Uh, still getting a little glare on the camera. Obviously, that's not what I'm seeing in real time, and I can, can still work.
There's a few cuts to remove this, this small notch of bone right here. Those are completed, that piece of bone is removed. We'll just ensure that the cuts are smooth. My assistant has a little block that helps to check that and ensure that our cuts are appropriate. We then remove this particular block. We're now repositioning a retractor so that we can proceed to the tibia. I like to use a laparotomy sponge to help protect the bone so that I'm not levering against it unnecessarily with this retractor. So we're bringing the tibia forward. In this step, I'm placing a retractor on the medial side to help protect the ligamentous structures and to give us exposure so we can work to our next steps. This is the T1 block. This is the tibial block. The feet, if you will, on the, the bottom of that guide have been painted with a marker. If you can see the purple dot areas on top of the tibia, we then use this device to remove the cartilage at that level so that we can reference off of the bone. Uh, any three-dimensional imaging like C CT scans uh, reference bone versus MRIs that reference soft tissue. So in this case, we're referencing the bone. Everything with this system is built off of the bony anatomy. And so we've got to get down to good bone. This block is then pinned into position so that we get a very flat, neutral cut on top of the tibia. In this instance, I've removed that particular block so that I can use an open block. This allows me to uh, cut off the top of the block without interference from the uh, captured guide. Sometimes this is done to change the level of resection. Once that fits on, we use a coker clamp to hold it in place, and that serves as a guide for the saw cut on the proximal tibia. Once the cut is completed, these pins are removed. And we may leave a small amount uncut and then finish that, as you're seeing in this step. We're always very careful to cut the bone but not get into the soft tissues. And then it's possible to lift up the cut surface of the tibia. And release that. Here I'm removing some fat pad and a portion of the lateral meniscus. We're repositioning a retractor to bring the tibia forward. This so-called T5 guide is then used to guide the placement of the tibial implant. This again is size and shape matched for this patient. So there's really a... Uh, only one good place for it to fit. We make that fit the appropriate profile of the tibia. 
There's then a step here to prepare for the post, that tibial implant. In this step, we're making some small perforations in the bone to allow our bone cement to interdigitate into the tibia to help to secure the fixation. In this step, we're bringing the knee to extension and using a spreader device to help open up the joint and keep tension on the ligaments. This allows me to see and remove the meniscus. This is the remainder of the medial meniscus that's being removed. Uh, some surgeons do a lot of this step in, in flexion and that works well. Also, I've done that as well. Um, I was trained to do this in extension, so I often do it this way. Now getting to the center of the knee, removing uh, very carefully a uh, remnant of the posterior cruciate ligament. Obviously, I need to see this uh, level very carefully. Uh, we don't want to get into soft tissue structures in the back of the knee. But most of this remnant of the posterior cruciate ligament is carefully removed. You'll then see this spreader switch to the opposite side of the knee. Retractors are placed so that I can repeat the same process with the lateral meniscus. In this step, I am injecting a combination of local anesthetic medicines in the posterior aspect of the knee. The anesthesiologist has already completed a nerve block with a long-acting local anesthetic. This helps to provide additional analgesia for the posterior portion of the knee that is not covered as well with the nerve block. The knee is then brought back up to flexion and retractors are placed. We're cleaning up uh, some soft tissue remnants and releasing a little bit of capsular tissue from the back of the knee that can be tight and can potentially block full extension of the knee. If you'll remember, this patient had what's referred to as a flexion contracture. Now, this is a trial femoral implant, and this is uh, fully customized as well. This is a disposable 3D printed piece that lets us see that we have a perfect fit. We're using a bone hook to expose the back of the knee and I'm going to check carefully for any uh, bone spurs that are potentially overhanging the implant along the sides of the knee uh, as well as in the back of the knee. In this step, I'm using a small osteotome to remove those bone spurs. using a uh, tool to extract those pieces that I just loosened in that previous step. 
we want to make sure that everything is is clean in the back of the knee. Uh, bone that is protuberant in this area uh, could potentially cause pain, but perhaps more importantly, the soft tissues of the knee have to drape across this, so it can be something that blocks range of motion. We want to get all of that out there so that this patient has the maximum possible range of motion uh, with their implant. Placing retractors again to expose the tibia. This is a trial tibial implant. Again, that is a 3D printed disposable piece. We're going to put it down on the bone. Same thing, the bone spurs or marginal osteophytes are removed. We take out the posterior retractor and we'll apply that femoral implant once more. This is the trial tibial insert, which is popped into position. The tractor is removed. At this point, we want to assess the knee and see what the range of motion is. Do we have full extension? We're checking this carefully, looking from the side. Do we have stability? We're applying stress forces to the knee and then seeing how much the knee flexes and what's the stability like. At this point, we're removing those trial implants. Cleaning up any debris. Placing retractors to expose the tibia again. Making a small cut. Uh, to clean up a protuberant area on the tibia. We're now carefully uh, irrigating the bone to remove any debris. After we've done that, we'll dry those bony surfaces. Unfortunately, we've had some debris that I think was overlying the camera more so than my eyes, so I didn't notice as we were filming this. But you're seeing us carefully dry the tibia here. A little bit of cleanup there as we get close to the end. You're seeing some cement applied to the bone and pressurized. Try to do this uh, and maintain as dry a possible environment and not have any uh, moisture on our cement. Sometimes we use a sponge to, to dab part of this after it's pressurized, as you see there. More cement placed in the tibia. Here you'll see the implant. Cement has been applied to it as soon as it came off of the mix. And the implant is placed in position. In this step, an impactor is used to impact the final implant into position and pressurize the cement. A 
unfortunately. And that step, our impactor, uh, became lodged in the implant itself. and was removed. And we oriented that a little bit differently to complete the impaction of the tibia. and removed all excess cement from the margins of the implant. We've removed retractors to expose the femur. We're going to dry that bone a little more just to ensure that that surface is as dry as possible. A small amount of cement is then applied to the femur itself, particularly in those uh, small lug holes. Uh, cement has previously been applied to the implant, so we're getting it on both surfaces. Femoral implant is impacted into position, and in a similar manner, we'll use these small tools to remove cement from the margins of the device. Care is taken to not uh, leave residual cement or get cement on the articulating surfaces of the implant. This is the polyethylene insert, which is made to sit down within the tibial tray. Once it's nearly into position, we'll move soft tissues out of the way and use an impactor to lock that in. We're now going to pressurize the knee in full extension to help push out any excess cement, which we then remove. We're removing excess cement from the top part of the knee. Now returning to the patella, which was the first surface that we resected. That bone is again washed and dried in a similar fashion to the tibia and femur. Once we're confident that the surface of the bone is sufficiently dry, we'll apply cement as well as the patellar implant, which has cement applied to it as well. Uh, this device helps to pressurize the patella. We'll remove some of that excess cement. The cement continues to expand a little bit as it hardens so there may be a little bit more to remove but we're going to get the bulk of this out of the way and get this clamp back on it to pressurize it while that cement cures
the knee is then uh, closed to restore the normal soft tissue anatomy.